this computer. Okay, so uh, the purpose of today uh, lecture is to do the final exam review. Wake up. So uh, let's see, you guys, uh, we are um, 12 o'clock section three, so our exam is relatively soon, it's six days from now. So um, better get going here. Uh, it'll be very similar to, uh, be very similar to uh, the midterm in format. So, um, the exam will appear a few minutes before 9.45 at the 13th. It'll appear on Canvas. It'll be a link that'll take you to the questions. Okay, uh, your solutions are gonna be in the form of .java files and maybe a star UML file. You're gonna zip all of those files together and upload them to Canvas no later than five minutes after the end of the class. So that'll be uh, 12, 1205, actually 1204 and 59 seconds, something like that. No comment on that question. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, it says here I'm planning four to five problems, but as I was going through the sample problems of the other class, and I think this will be more like three to four problems. Of course, we'll have access to the internet, books, notes, all of that sort of thing. But I wanna make this clear, um, no collaboration or communication during the exam with anyone except me. I, um, and and I'll start a Zoom session for the time of the exam. So I'll be there for questions. You can send your questions to me, probably privately, unless you think it's like a typo or something like that that you know, everybody needs to know about. Uh, and uh, yeah, so, so I mean, we're all like on the honor system here. Uh, you know, I mean, if I, if I think an exam is suspicious, I won't grade it. And what that means is that, uh, is that you, oh, let's see, hang on a second. I'm just getting a message from somebody uh, who's at the grocery store. Um, I have to take advantage of that when I can. out of coffee. I have not actually had to go to the grocery store for months now because I was have neighbors going or somebody going. So uh, anyway, what are we doing on the final exam? Um, let's see. Um, right. So, so I won't grade it if it's suspicious. And that means that that person's going to get like a zero in their final exam. So do your own work. Uh, the emphasis of the exam would be post midterm uh, material, but it's possible there could be midterm, pre midterm material. There's a link to the midterm. Wouldn't be a bad idea. Um, you know, I forget which midterm was your midterm, but you could take, give yourself an hour to do the problems from the other midterm and grade it yourself just to see you know, how, uh, how you've done. Quick review of what we covered since the midterm. Now, MVC, you know, is not really, we started that before the midterm actually, but that's gonna be important for the final exam. We discussed uh, major uh, architectural design patterns, model view controller being probably the most basic one. And then for each of these architectures, we introduced like a, a framework implemented in Java, so that was our MVC framework. Uh, these were some of the design patterns that were introduced in the MVC uh, framework, publisher, subscriber, commands as objects, 
abstract factory, and so forth. These were some of the technologies that were covered. So a lot of swing stuff. Event delegation, that's the action listener uh, business. And action listener is, uh, that's like when you push a button, it fires an action event. And then, uh, you know, we think we had, uh, what was it? It was the, uh, it was the um, app panel was the action listener and it called its action performed method and so they figured out what it was that you know was supposed to happen uh we also uh, when i say publisher subscriber here java beans um i think was also is that oh yeah here it is java beans the model was a bean and it fired property change events and so the views listen for those property change events and would repaint themselves when they got them. Uh, panel control tree, this is what I mean is like this tree where the parent nodes are J panels and the leaf nodes are controls like buttons and menu items and text fields and labels and things like that. So that's really the composite pattern there. Layout strategies, so there we use the strategy design pattern. And also the composite pattern, because remember what we would do is we would nest panels within panels within panels, and each panel may be having a different layout strategy. Uh, and then object streams, be able to save an object to a file, read it back from the file. And that actually involved the decorator or proxy pattern, because we had to take a basic uh, stream, um, byte stream, and then we had to wrap layers around it to get it so that it could swallow an object. These were some of the customizations of MVC that we did. Smartbox and SimStation were customizations. The next architecture was the agent-based architecture. Uh, SimStation was the uh, framework for that. SimStation, the customization of MVC. Uh, and there we introduced the strategy design pattern. We saw that again with Prisoner's Dilemma. And of course, the master slave pattern, right? The master was a simulation and the slaves were the agents. And this is also kind of like the peer to peer architecture that we talked about when we talked about distributed architectures. So the agents are peers with each other. You know, an agent, agent one can send a request to agent two and agent two replies, but then later on, agent two sends the request, a request to agent one and agent one replies. So there isn't any clear client agent, server agent, they're all kind of the same. The Java technologies there, well, that's where we introduce threads, the runnable interface, and you should know how to start, suspend, resume, uh, uh, threads, and then synchronization. So here there was this syntax that you should know. Synchronized, and then in parentheses, any object at all that's going to function as a lock. Remember we talked about the lock on, uh, you know, an airplane bathroom here. Then this block here, inside this block that's inside the bathroom, right? That's called the critical section. Critical section is a section of code that should only be executed by one thread at a time. So each thread is going to have to wait until it can take hold and own this lock before it can enter the critical section. Again, it's really just simple bathroom logic. And then wait, notify, remember there we had that problem where the consumer uh, for the bank account had to wait until there were sufficient funds in the Producer, you know, after he deposited funds, had to call notify to unblock uh, consumers that were waiting. We also had to use that in a readers and writers problem. Here were the customizations that we did of the uh, of the sim station. Moving on, uh, we talked about client server architecture and our implementation. Our framework there was Echo. Okay. Uh, here were you know, some of the design patterns that we talked about. The Java technology were sockets and server sockets. And then these were some of the customizations that we did. Our final architecture was the component container architecture. 
and uh, SmartBox was our implementation. Uh, we used the adapter prop pattern somewhere. I can't think where at the moment. We talked about open architecture, which is really just another name for component container architecture. In a sense, open architecture is where a container component where we publish the details of the container class so that third party developers can develop components for it that can be plugged, sold to our customers and plugged in. Oh, adapter for the stack machine, I guess. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, uh, that's right. Uh, remember, Java had a stack class in it, but we couldn't use it as is because that stack was not a, uh, didn't extend component. So we had to create our own stack that can, the extended component, and then the Java stack was the adaptee. And of course, the big technology here is Java reflection. Okay. Um, the fact that classes, methods, fields uh, can all be represented by objects in Java. And, and that seems a little dizzying to think of that. But, uh, but if you, I mean, we represent lots of weird things with objects and object-oriented programming, you know, why not? Why not have object-oriented programming turn in on itself and represent itself? Represent its own classes, its own methods, its own fields. Customization, stack machine, statistics calculator. Um, okay. So that's a quick review of the way I saw the course going, introduce like an architecture, introduce uh, a framework for that architecture, introduce uh, sort of smaller patterns along the way, um, introduce some, some accompanying Java technologies and so forth. So, um, so let's get to the sample problems right away. Now, for all of these sample problems I have, the ones that I like are the ones at the beginning here. Um, they all depend on you having running frameworks. So that should be set up in your code. Uh, and so, you know, like for example, with problem one, you're gonna customize model view controller, right? So you should have like a working MVC. And then what you would do is you would, uh, you would export, um, the source code. So I'm not interested in your, uh, not interested this time in your executor binaries, your source code uh, somewhere and you zip it up and your source code would include MVC and in this, you know, and any other classes that you wrote. And you're going to zip all of that up and, and upload it to Canvas. Let's see, uh, maybe I could do little demos of this. Um, 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 let's see, so this is an MVC app clock, clock panel, I think. This is a pretty simple little application. Each time I hit tick, Notice the time is four o'clock and right, this thing jumps by, um, let's see, so pi divided by six pi over six, what is that, 30, de 30 degrees? Yeah, 30 degrees. Um, <clears throat> so, um, And I give you some code for it, but I think this code I give you, I have to maybe update it. It's a little bit different than, um, than what I made a few, some, a little change to it. You can come down here to the bottom. Here I put all of the code in a single file. Let's see, how do I want to do this? I want to, here, so. You're customizing MVC, you probably be asked to do that. First thing uh, to do is what's your model gonna be? So here I introduce clock, 
Uh, what's the business data? Well, it's going to be the hour. What's the business logic? Well, it'll be incrementing the hour by one mod 12. Whenever you change the business data, you have to remember to call changed inherited from model. That fires the property change event for you. Okay, you're also going to need commands, one for each menu item or each button. We only have one button, the tick button. So here's the tick command. You have to call, uh, have to have a constructor that takes a model as an input and calls supermodel. Okay, and, and Java Eclipse will generate that for you actually if you under the source menu. And then you have to have an execute method. And the execute method always begins by casting the model as to whatever kind of thing you have, clock, and then invoking some business logic. Done. Okay, I'm going to skip over the view for a moment. Here is the clock panel, and it extends at panel. And, uh, you know, and yours is going to start out the same as this. It takes a factory as an input. It calls super factory. You're going to have a grid layout. It's here's a one, two layout, one row, two columns. So the left column will be for the button panel. The right column will be for the view. Here I'm creating the button panel. I'm going to set its layout. And your layout will be the same. Grid two, one, two rows and one column. That's because that's because I have. Uh, had a button and below it a text field. Like if you had five buttons, this would be five one. Okay, and then I do this trick where for each control that I'm going to add to the button panel, these five lines of code. So I create a panel P that's going to have a flow layout. I create a button. The name of the button will be the name of the command. Okay, uh, I will add this as the action listener to the button. I'll put the button in P and then I'll put P into the button panel. You do that for each thing. And then at the end, I'm going to add the button panel and I'll add uh, the, a new clock view. Now, this particular one, as you saw, had a label in it that showed the hour. Each time I click tick, the hour go one, two, three. Okay. Um, now, the beauty of MVC is that the commands, like tick, are actually handled in the framework itself. So App Factory up here, when you push the tick button, and it issues a tick command. Okay, the App Factory already knows how to handle that, knows how to execute it. Right, it uses. I'm sorry, not the app factory. Sorry, the app panel. Where am I? Right. The app panel already knows how to deal with that. Right, it uses the factory to turn the name of the command into a command, and then it sends the command to the command processor. Okay. But here I have this little display, which is a J label, where I'm displaying the temperature. App panel, uh, this is like more of an output thing. The app panel, it's not a command, so the app panel won't know about that. So to update that, I need to put in my own property change listener. I'll take this event. Now, maybe this event is the tick command. Well, I'm going to send it up to the app panel's property change. Let him take care of it. In any case, uh, I'm going to get the clock. And uh, in that display, I'll set the text to be time, whatever clock dot get hour is. And here's main, which takes a clock factory. Clock factory is here, implements app factory. Again, you can just push a button on Eclipse and it'll generate stubs for all of the methods in here, right? You can just fill them in and a lot of them, you know, I'm probably not going to look at your help menu. so. You know, you can just have like some random string there, the help menu, uh, the about menu, uh, title, you know, whatever. I mean, that's all pretty easy. Get edit commands is a return, it returns an array of strings. Make edit command takes a string and um, returns a command, and of course, make model. Now, clock view is tricky here. It's tricky because there's a bunch of bunch of trigonometry and, and, and transforming coordinates involved and so forth. 
So uh, here is the size of my canvas. It's going to be 250 by 250. It's like the gray part of the component. And then origin XC, origin YC down here, that's going to be the center of the canvas. So that's where the hour hand begins from, from the center. And then I need a paint component. It's a graphical context. It's the canvas as an input. It's going to begin by grabbing the clock and getting the business data, getting the hour of the clock. Okay, and then here's where things got a little bit tricky. What angle? I'm trying to calculate the other end of the hour hand. And I'm using trigonometry. I know it's going to be cosine of some angle and sine of some angle, which is what I'm doing here. Okay, and, and so I know that each angle, uh, angle between hours and a clock, uh, is 2 pi over 12, it's going to be pi over 6. Okay, so that'll be, which is, what is that, 30 degrees maybe? Um, pi is 180, I think it's going to be 30 degrees. So then, um, so then it was tricky because like at noon, Okay, uh, it should be pi over two. Okay, uh, and at three o'clock, right, it should be zero degrees. So uh, the formula I figured out was pi over two minus pi over six times how, what hour it is. Okay, now the other thing that was tricky about this, and I'll give you the code for this in case it comes up on the exam, was I'm calculating the x and y coordinate at the other end of the hour hand, but that x and y coordinate, that sine and cosine, are assuming that the origin is at the center. Okay, but that's not the coordinate system used by the canvas. Coordinate system used by the canvas, the origin is the upper left corner, the x-axis runs across, positive x-axis runs across the top of the screen. Positive y-axis runs backwards down the left-hand side of the screen. And so what I did was, I, and this came up several times, and so what I did was I added, created a point class and I put it in MVC. And you're welcome to copy this class if you want. So this, here's the x and y coordinate of a point. Okay, uh, it's a value class, so I have hash code and equals for it. Those are auto-generated, by the way. And then I have this transform method. It takes the size of the canvas as an input, and it translates coordinates from uh, center-oriented, so I call that Cartesian or CRT coordinates, to the canvas coordinates, and I worked out this formula for doing it. So. Coming back here, then I use that formula. Where do I use it? It's used up in the view here. Yeah, so I've calculated this end here is the end point of the hour hand in Cartesian coordinates. And I'm going to transform it into as the end point in canvas coordinates. And I just draw a line from the origin to that. Traffic simulation. Okay, so, oh wait, this is the code. I have to go to the problem. So here's the problem. If cars could uh, could go drive in random directions, but didn't like to crash, would traffic lanes naturally evolve? So you have this situation of cars just uh, maybe it's in a parking lot and they're just driving like crazy all around this parking lot. Okay, uh, so you can drive wherever you want to go, any direction you want. I think the speed, I have one here, but I think the speed, speed is constant. But you can drive anywhere you feel like driving in a parking lot is your first rule. Your second rule, though, is that you don't like to crash into other cars. And so uh, if you have a system like this, will the cars eventually form lanes? Okay, uh, and here the rule not liking to crash is translated this way. If a car gets near another, it changes its heading to the opposite of the neighbor's heading. So let's, um, I'm going to start this one up. 
Um, hang on one second while I start it up. Um, I guess you could see me start it up. So this was a sim station. I keep my sim station uh, customizations here, and it's called traffic. bigger. There are the cars moving around. You can see some of the accidents happening there. Cars are bumping off of each other, having little accidents. And now look, they're forming lanes. Isn't that cool? So they don't need, you don't need police to tell you which way to go. Of course, they, there will be a few fender benders in order to get to that. So uh, let's look at the solution for this. So uh, for something like this, you start with your agent subclass, so car. Okay, uh, and I guess look, I set the speed to two here. Okay. That doesn't matter. And then for each agent, you need, when you introduce an agent subclass, you need an update method. And remember that's abstract in the agent base class. And so here I'm with the world that's inherited from agent and it points to the simulation. Uh, and so I'm going to ask for a neighbor car, so a neighbor of this within a radius of say 20 pixels. I call that my neighbor. And if the neighbor's not null, okay, I get the heading of the neighbor. And then if the neighbor's going north, I go south. He's going south, I'll go north and so forth. And then I call move. Okay, we need a factory, uh, traffic factory extends simulation factory this time. And all you really need is this make model returns a new traffic simulation. That's our model. Remember the simulation is the model here. Okay, and then here is the, this is the simulation class, a traffic simulation. Populate, I'm gonna populate this with 50 cars. And then main, I use the traffic factory and away we go. So really, Kind of uh, not very much code here. So that something like that would make a good uh, midterm. Here's another customization of SimStation. Um, this one didn't quite work out to what I had hoped it would work out to. Uh, so uh, I'll tell you what my, my goal is with this was, is, um, you know, I gave you that reader's writer's problem. So um, and what I was after here is some kind of a synchronization problem, a problem that would involve like uh, having to do some tricky synchronization. Uh, and the Dining Philosophers is notorious for that. Um, but, um, but, you know, it didn't, my implementation, you know, sort of fell short of the synchronization that I was hoping to, to get, I'll explain later. So famous problem, five philosophers are dining at the Golden Dragon restaurant. It has to be a Chinese restaurant because they're gonna eat with chopsticks. So I decided to use uh, the Golden Dragon up there in San Francisco. Uh, they're seated at a circular, circular table. Between each two philosophers is a single chopstick. I don't know what's the matter with the Golden Dragon. Why they only give one chopstick per customer. Um, to eat, a philosopher needs two chopsticks. When he grabs the chop, when the chopstick on his left is available, he's going to grab it. When the chopstick on his right is available, he's going to grab it. And now he's got two chopsticks so he can eat. Eating is good, so he's going to turn green. Uh, when he's not eating, then he's thinking and he turns red. So let's um, run this real quickly. 
let's see, I think this is Philosophers, and, no, no, Golden Dragon. I don't know if you can see it, but I have the five philosophers, these five dots. And the hardest part of this was getting them to sit in a little circle like this. You can see they're turning red and green. And, and you can also sort of see the pattern here of like kind of going around in circles like that. And now it seems to have broken the pattern. It's good. And then stats. Let's see, show the desktop. So stats here uh, shows that Socrates has gotten to eat 64 times, Lao Tzu 63, Wittgenstein 63. So they're all like, uh, they're all getting enough to eat. Nobody's starving. Let's look at, oops, let's look at Golden Dragon. Here's Golden Dragon. That's really just the philosopher code that I'm mostly interested in for this problem. Uh, I've def how, here are the phases a philosopher can be in, eating or thinking. Chopstick is just an empty class. And then here's a philosopher extends agent. So again, we always go for the agent class. He has two chopsticks assigned to him that he's, all he's allowed to use, left stick and right stick. Here's his phase, and this is how many times he's gotten to eat. This is to detect starvation. Then we come down here to the update method. And so this is like what I want you to pay attention to. Okay, so uh, if he's in his thinking phase, okay, well, it's time to eat then. Okay, and so now he has got to grab his left chopstick. Okay, let's say, you know, this philosopher is Socrates, and let's say, you know, Wittgenstein is sitting to his left. Okay, so uh, he and Wittgenstein, Socrates and Wittgenstein, are sharing this same chopstick. His Socrates' left stick is Wittgenstein's right stick. Okay, and so uh, when Socrates has the left stick, then Wittgenstein can't have it, right? And so we have to synchronize on that. We need to, uh, again, go back to the bathroom door. We need to be able to lock it. Right, yes, yeah, so we need a lock associated with the left stick, you know, so you can kind of lock it when you've got it. And, and well, in Java, every object can be used as a lock. So why not have the left stick itself be its own lock? And so I'm going to synchronize on the left stick. Okay, what that means is that if Wittgenstein is using it, then when Socrates executes this code, Socrates will be suspended until Wittgenstein lets it go. And then Socrates will be resumed. Socrates, by the way, doesn't know that he's been suspended because he'll be kind of unconscious, right? And so he wakes up and he now goes into this block, his critical section. Now he's got to grab the right stick. Okay, and maybe Lao Tzu is sitting on his right. And so he has to wait for Lao Tzu to, to finish. And so again, he has to wait for the right stick. And then when it's available, now once that it's available and Socrates enters this block, Socrates is the temporary owner of the right stick. Okay, so uh, Lao Tzu cannot, you know, cannot get it. Right? It's reserved. So he can set his phase to eating, he increments his eat count, just to like drive his neighbors nuts. He's gonna take a little 100 you know, millisecond nap here. Uh, and then when he exits this first block, well, now Lao Tzu can take the chopstick. When he exits this block, then Wittgenstein gets that cho other chopstick. Now he's gonna go back to thinking. 
keep the view for a second. Uh, here's the Golden Dragon Extend simulation. So here, all of the work was in the constructor. We constructed uh, five chopsticks, an array of five chopsticks, an array of five philosophers. I initialized the chopsticks, the philosophers. The hardest part of this is setting the position of the philosophers. So I'm using that same MVC point that I showed you before, you know, and I'm setting it up using trigonometry, assuming uh, Cartesian coordinates centered at the center. And, and, and then I have to transform the positions of the philosopher to canvas coordinates. So that was our part. And, but, you know, really, I don't care about it. That was purely aesthetic. If something like this comes up and you think, oh, well, you know, this involves trigonometry and, you know, I'm just going to like put the philosophers wherever I want to put them. That's fine. Um, you know, maybe it lose a point depending on how important the pattern was, but you know, that's not the big thing here. Populate, I add five philosophers to the simulations agents list and get stats. Uh, I have to expand the array, uh, the basic array, which shows the clock and the number of philosophers by printing out the eat count for each philosopher. Now here, the view is also something tricky here. Uh, the normal view, the simulation view, is the view we used in the last problem. The default there is just a bunch of red dots moving around the screen. But that doesn't work here because these dots, sometimes they're red and sometimes they're green. So I needed to create a custom view, golden dragon view, extends view. Okay, and paint component is going to go through all of the agents and if the agent is eating, then he colors him red. I think I got it backwards, it should have been green. Uh, otherwise, he taught colors in green. Okay, and draws a little fill oval here. So that means that the factory, extends simulation factory, make model makes a new Golden Dragon restaurant. Okay, uh, but we need get view as well now, because this normally the view would be a simulation view, but now it's going to be the golden dragon view we just looked at. Okay. Oh, synchronous. What I really like is what I was going for there. It, that simulation, by the way, the code I presented you, it, it's working. The philo no, the philosophers are starving to death, but it's somehow like the pattern that got set up there. Okay. Uh, it's easy to imagine a pattern where all of the philosophers starve to death. Imagine this. They all sit down and, and they all immediately pick up the chopstick to their left. Now that code shows that they don't let go of the left chopstick. They're waiting for the right chopstick, but that right chopstick is never available. You know, um, for example, uh, Wittgenstein's waiting for his right chopstick, but that's Socrates' left chopstick. He has it. Socrates won't put it down until Lao Tzu uh, is finished with uh, his left chopstick. Okay, because that's the, the right chopstick that Socrates needs. And Lao Tzu is waiting, and it goes all the way back around to Wittgenstein, right? And so everybody's got their left chopstick. Everybody's waiting for their right chopstick, which never comes. So I couldn't get that situation to happen, but that is a possible situation. And, and I don't really, my code doesn't solve that. So that's why it's a complicated problem. So it, here, what I wanted to do was add to that um, some kind of wait and notify, use the wait notify mechanism, but it got pretty complicated when I did that. Let's move on to echo. So a firewall proxy blocks certain commands considered harmful to the client. Implement a reusable firewall handler class that has a block method that returns true if the client request is in a table of blocked requests. Well, it's not necessarily a table here. Um, 
So, and then test it by uh, blocking division and subtraction commands from reaching the mass server. Now, really what the echo, what a firewall proxy is doing is, I mean, one of the things is it's preventing you from visiting harmful websites, for example, uh, the typical thing for it. Um, but for some reason, we're gonna consider dividing and, and subtraction harmful. Here's my firewall handler class. So let's just have a quick review here about how uh, Echo works. So in Echo, clients send requests to the server. Okay, the server creates some kind of a request handler thread, connects it to the client with sockets, and now the server resumes listening for more incoming requests while the client and the request handler thread have a conversation. Okay, so the scenario I want you to imagine is that maybe there are 10 clients and 10 request handlers, one for each client. So we've got, what, 21, 21 threads running, 10 client threads, 10 request handler threads, and then the server as well. Okay, uh, and, the, and, then, um, and then we introduce proxy handler. Proxy handler is a special kind of request handler. When it receives a request to the client, it forwards the request to a peer. When it receives the response from the peer, it returns the response to the client. Okay, now the peer or proxy handler could be another proxy handler. And so it's possible to chain together proxy handlers. And then usually the last thing would just be an ordinary request handler, like a math request handler, something like that. Okay, so next. Um, so I need a place to store the blocked commands. And here I said table, but you know, set seem more appropriate to me. So a set of, of strings, not a list because there isn't any particular ordering here that's significant. And also, um, also the members are unique. So that says you should be using a set. So block, this is a set of strings of blocked commands. Okay, now the other thing is, remember we've got 10, um, 10 of these firewall handlers running at the same time, okay, connected to 10 different clients. And uh, I'm gonna refresh this because I think I did make some changes to this code. Uh, we've got 10 of these things running at the same time. Uh, they all have to share the same set of blocked commands. So I made it static. That means there's just gonna be one set shared by everybody. Okay, that means access to this shared resource has to be synchronized. But I didn't want to declare, so here I have block, this is how you add something to the set, unblock, remove something from the set, new block sees if, some, if the set contains something. Okay, so I wanted these things to be synchronized. I want to avoid a situation like this. I want to know is subtract blocked. It's not blocked, but um, let's see, we're about to block subtraction, but in the middle of adding it to the set, we get interrupted by another thread asking is subtraction blocked? And it returns false, even though we were in the middle of adding it to the table. So we want to avoid situations like that. So, uh, so we need to lock, have a lock associated with the blocked set, the set of blocked uh, commands, okay? And, and here again, well, why not just have blocked set itself be its own lock? And so I'm synchronizing on that. Now, what we were doing, and this is like my fault, you know, at one point I said, oh, well, just these should be, just make, uh, 
think block, unblock, and is block, just make them synchronized methods. When I thought about it, I realized that does not work because there, uh, I mean, the default, if you make a method synchronized, then it's equivalent of having the word this in there. Okay, so you're synchronizing on the firewall handler, you're not synchronizing on the table of block or the set of blocked commands. Okay, it's sort of like in the bathroom equivalent, if, uh, you know, like if every passenger has their own lock rather than a lock on the door. It's the door that needs, the bathroom door that needs the lock, not the passengers who need the lock. Of course, the passengers are never locked. Okay, so, so, uh, so there then, and the, the critical thing is, is synchronizing on the set, the resource that you're trying to access. And I wrote static here, but you know, now that I'm thinking about it, really there shouldn't be any reason, since these are synchronized, shouldn't be any reason why these need to be static. And then here's my response method, okay? So uh, I'm gonna get this request from the client and I'm gonna parse it into an array of tokens. This little thing here means uh, uh, the members of the string, um, the separators, are sequences of white space characters. Okay, uh, now there are um, three possible commands. One is block, you know, something. So if the token zero is block, I'll assume tokens one is what you want to block. And so I'm going to block it and return this string saying, okay, it's now blocked. If the token zero is unblocked, Okay, then here I'm going to unblock it and tell you it's unblocked. Otherwise, token zero uh, is just some command like add, multiply, subtract, divide, or whatever. Okay, if that is blocked, then uh, the result is just this apology. I'm sorry, it's blocked. If it's not blocked, then I'm going to send the request on to super is the proxy handler and its response method forwards it to the peer okay and i'm going to get back whatever that response was and i return the results hmm. Let's see, in the last else statement, there's an error showing an unhandled exception, type exception. I think we should add throws exception. Let's see if I can. The last method. Um, Stephen, are you talking about get that chat back? So are you talking about this code, Stephen? response method here. And then what you want to do is throw an exception if the thing is blocked. Is that what you're suggesting? Yeah, uh, the, uh, that's a possibility. Uh, you could throw an exception. If you throw an exception here, I catch it in the run method of request handler. And, uh, and I fooled around with how I handled that, is that I handled that. Um, I do think uh, at first what I was doing was I was shutting down the request handler, which is too draconian, I think, right? Uh, I mean, there's no reason why we should end the session just because you've given like a banned, a blocked command. I think I did change that, in which case throwing an exception here would, would work. So he's talking about instead of just returning a result, throwing, uh, throwing an exception here. Uh, but then, you know, I would want to make sure that the request handler isn't going to terminate just because this happened. So I like that. Very, uh, very short, easy to write this code. The logic's pretty simple. Uh, and then there's like some synchronization, some non-trivial synchronization issues in here. Good problem.
So, um, what about customizing SmartBox? Okay, so here um, it's this casino game that I invented. Uh, we did like a did a game have request handler for casino. And so this is uh, like a sort of a rip off of blackjack. Dealer gets a random number between one and twenty one, uh, and the player uh, either gives the command quit, hit, or stay. I think help also. Uh, if the command is hit, the dealer generates a random number between one and ten and adds it to the player total. The player total exceeds twenty one. He loses. Uh, if the player gives the stay command, then the game ends and the winner is determined. Player player wins if his total is bigger than the dealer total but less than or equal to twenty one. And so you have to implement this as a smart box component. It says use the console component developed for the stack machine and command processor interface. Okay, so let's uh, actually run this thing. So these are the smart box components. Okay. And uh, and so I'm going to, here's my container, uh, let's see, not container, console. Remember, this is this console um, that we developed. I think I gave you the code for this thing. Uh, and it's basically just got a read, execute, print loop. But it assumes here, command processor is an interface. It assumes that there is a command processor that actually does the work of executing the commands. So this is, in a sense, a kind of a model view controller. The, the, the REPL, the read, execute, print loop, is a console user interface. So that does the presentation. And then the processor here is the, like our command processor. It's the control aspect of model view controller. It knows how to get these commands executed. And of course, if we look at command processor, it's just this interface. I'd say, give me a command and I'll return, you know, some result. Okay, so let me go up here to container panel and we'll run that. And here I'm going to add a console. I'm going to add, uh, I think it was called a casino. At this point, the container, smart box, has figured, hey, console requires the command processor interface, and casino provides the command processor interface. So I'm going to hook these guys up. And I'll do run console. Now, at this point, the action shifts back to Eclipse. Eclipse. Here's the console running. I can say hit. Got a few cards going here. Okay, now I'm nervous. 19. You know, uh, I'm afraid of going over 21, so I'll say stay. Right? And I beat the, uh, I beat the casino. Okay, uh, if I say hit again, it says, hey, what are you doing? Game is over, right? So I'd have to do new. Okay, and I busted the um, So let's look a look at the code for the casino. And Again, I like this because it's really kind of short. I've given you the code for this. So casino, you have to extend component and you have to implement command processor. Okay, which means that you need this execute method. And this is just code that I copy pasted from casino uh, when I had the casino as a request handler. So this is like kind of the logic of that game. That's your business logic there. 
right? And, uh, you know, and, and then here I have one random number generator. So don't create a bunch of random number generators or otherwise you're not going to get randomness. And so I made it static. There's only one of these random number generators. Everybody's sharing it. Right? Um, casino total, player total, and so forth. So I'll let you go through that code. So again, I like that problem. It's not a lot of code, big ideas, but not a lot of code. Now, one thing that um, I'm keen on is reflection, getting you to do something with reflection. So I wanted a reflection problem in here. And here uh, I've got this, um, this universal machine. So a universal machine is something that can execute any algorithm if it's written in the machine's language. So we can use reflection, see. In the console, did you have to override the um, execute method? So are you talking about, let's see, let me just do this. You implemented command processor. Well, no, the, uh, the override, let's take a quick look at that code here. The override happens in Casino because it implements command processor, right? And command processor, remember execute is abstract. And so I have to override that abstract method in, in the Casino. The, uh, the console doesn't care. Uh, about execute. It's using any execution it does, it just passes it off to, let's take a quick look again at that console code. All right, so here in REPL, I figured out your request is not null, your request is not quit. So it must be something I don't know how to deal with. So I go to the processor and I call its execute method, which is abstract, and it's overridden by casino to, you know, say, okay, well, if it's hit or stay or new or help or quit, you know, I'll take care of it. So it's not an override. Right? In other words, I'm delegating it to whoever is implementing the processor, command processor. But in Smartbox, um, I get an error when I say console. A console doesn't implement. Console requires it. It doesn't implement it. Look, my console class is a component that implements app, but it requires, remember, in, um, in Smartbox, you either implement an interface or you use an interface. Implement it means like, well, that's what Casino, it implements, it provides the interface, the command processor interface, The console uses the command processor interface, meaning that it's got a field of type command processor. And then later on, it uses that processor here to execute commands. So he doesn't implement it, he requires it. Get the difference? Every, compo every component will have like a set of required interfaces and a set of, of provided interfaces. Provided interfaces are interfaces that that component implements. Required interfaces are those interfaces that the component has fields of, of that type. Good, 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 good. Okay, so let's see. So, um, where are we? All right, so the universal machine. So this is a, um, how does it, is it stated? Yeah, so um, it can execute. So your job here is um, to create a universal machine in Java. 
it's his virtual machine, shoot, I should say universal machine. In Java, that's able to execute any method, given the name of the method, the name of its class, and the array of and an array of method arguments. And so then I give you some codes to customize. Okay, and this code is giving you some code to test on. So this is like, remember we did this example with notes. It, here the difference, this version of note, I have note, horn note extends note, violin note extends note. They all have a play method, but in this case, the play method has two parameters, uh, the frequency of the note and the duration of the note. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's look at the code. Let's see, where do we want to go for the code? Um, let's, let's look at the code clips, I guess. Sounds like somebody's not muted, so make sure you're muted. You're making that noise. I think I put mine um, in demos, uh, reflection demos. So here's my universal machine. Okay, so I don't think I need this, this two string method. It doesn't really do anything. So uh, here I have my method uh, in universal machine called call method. Okay, here's the name of the class, the name of the method, and then args are the inputs to the method. I don't know how many arguments there are for this method, so it's an array, and I don't know what kind of arguments they are, so it's an array of objects. And then here's the value that the method will return, and all I know about it is it's some kind of an object. Before we look at the code, which is the part you have to do, let's look at main. This is how we're testing it. I like this code, it's kind of crazy. So here I'm gonna create a new universal machine, um, and then I do um.callMethod, and here's the name of the class, violin note, here's the name of the method, play, and here are the inputs, 10 and 30, frequency 10, duration 30. Now we'll try it again. So, uh, oh, and I'm gonna print out the result here. And then I'm going to call it again, um.call method. This time the class is horn notes. The method is play. And the inputs are 10 and 30 again. And I'll print out the result. And then get this. The last time, the last demo, um.call method. The name of the class is universal machine. The name of the method is call method. So call method is call and call method. Okay, and then the inputs to call method is this array, violin note, play, and then an array within an array, 4455. So, so universal machine, you know, one of the things about universality is being able to you know, being able to execute yourself. And that, of course, like gets into all kinds of interesting philosophical issues. So let's run this. Here it is playing the violin note. Here it is playing the horn note. And then here it is calling itself calling play violin notes. It gets that too. So the problem then, so this is all given. What's not given is the inside of this try block here, what goes in here. Okay, so let's walk through this. You're given the name of the class. Okay, so I'm gonna use class name here to do this class dot for name. Remember what that is, like let's say the class name is violin note. It'll look for violin note dot class. It'll that file. It'll load that file into the virtual machine, and it'll return a Java object representing the class. I'm calling that some class. Next, I'd like to create a new instance of that class. 
So some class dot get declared constructors dot new instance. And that's going to return an object. That object might be a violin note, for example. Or that object could be a, a universal machine. Okay. Now, I want to get the method. I've got the method name. Let's say play. But you know that overloading means that you could have lots of methods in a class with the same name. Right? You're going to have name sharing, but they're going to have different parameter types. So how do I get the parameter types? So here, uh, I'm going to create an array called arg types. This is an array of class objects. The length of this will be exactly the length of the arguments. Now I iterate through the arguments. And for each argument, arg sub i, I get the class of that argument and I load it into this array. So now, for example, uh, the play method had two arguments, right, uh, 10 and 30. Those were both of type integer. So arg types is going to be the array integer integer. And now I can use that arg types together with the method name to get the method from some class. So meth is now the method with that name that takes those particular arg types. And then I can invoke the method to get the result, and I return the result. This is really kind of the essence of reflection, and it's really you know kind of what reflection is designed for. This, in a nutshell, is like everything that we're doing in uh, everything that we're doing in Smartbox. We're actually doing a little bit more in Smartbox because we have to set the fields of this object as well, which is kind of tricky. Okay. Um, so those are the problems that I like the best. Here's a design problem. Um, so here you'd create a UML diagram and you'd be using certain design patterns. You look for opportunities to use design patterns. That's what I'm looking for, there usually be some obvious design patterns that um, you should have used. Um, and and I'm, I'm looking to see if you caught that in your, in your class diagram. Um, this is just a, I don't know, I kind of like this problem a little bit here. It's a real simple kind of problem. Here I give you a, a bunch of design patterns. Some of the patterns are bogus. Okay. And then here I give you some situations and I ask which pattern would be the right pattern for this situation. For example, uh, a soldier needs to be able to change battle tactics quickly. Or you can think of it a virtual soldier in a virtual battle if you want. So what pattern would seem to be the best for that? Okay, well, Tactics, battle tech, changing your tactics is changing your behavior. And to be able to do it quickly means, you know, not having to go back and rewrite code or anything like that. So to me, that would suggest the strategy design pattern. And we saw that, right? And we had the gladiators changing their weapons while the fight was going on. Um, here, a recipe for vegetable soup needs to be independent of where the vegetables are obtained. So we don't know where the vegetables are going to come from Safeway or they're going to come from Trader Joe's. You know, we don't know that yet. But what we do know is if we had the vegetables, uh, how to assemble them into vegetable soup. We know the recipe, but not where the vegetables are going to come from. So here I'm trying to get you to think of abstract factory. So we used abstract factory. We knew how to assemble an MVC application. You know, we knew how to connect the model and the views and the, the, you know, the controls, uh, the commands and all of that. But we didn't know what the commands were going to be, what the model was going to be. Right? So we used the abstract factory to separate construction of assembly from the acquisition or construction of the 
components of the assembly. And then this last one is just kind of a simple coding problem. Uh, here we have this toolkit that needs a calculator type I calculator. Here's this I calculator that's been defined. Okay, and uh, being lazy programmers, we look around, has anybody implemented this interface? You know, we need this, need the ability to do this future value monthly payment. We find financial calculator here. Financial calculator does sort of do this for us. Okay, it's got these methods, or names are slightly different, but the functionality is correct. But it doesn't implement this interface here. And so here, what we have to do is use the adapter pattern. Um, calculator adapter implements the correct interface, and its adapt is the old object, right? And it's going to delegate to that, um, to that. So it goes between the two. Okay. So that's kind of kind of at the end of, of class now. That may seem like a lot. You might be sitting at home trembling, thinking about all of that. But uh, I'm probably going to be like three problems like that. You know, uh, probably some emphasis on customizing or altering the frameworks that we studied. Uh, uh, probably not a lot of code. Uh, you can probably copy and paste code from similar customizations if you have all of that there. Uh, but be careful. On the midterm, some of you who did that, and you, like an Eclipse, when you paste code from one applicant from one program into another, it sometimes inserts import statements in there. So you'll like get imports from uh, Turtle Graphics or something. And that sort of screws things up. The code won't compile because it says, oh, like it won't compile when it comes to me because it'll say, oh, there's no Turtle Graphics around. So when you paste code in from other things you've written, check to make sure that it, 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 the import statements weren't automatically inserted there and get rid of those. Um, but otherwise, yeah, it'll be uh, pretty similar. You have lots of examples. And also remember, uh, when you upload code, uh, you upload like the framework code as well. Customization shouldn't um, depend on each other. Can you please upload the SimStation solution for us? And isn't that there already? Um, let's take a quick look. Um, Some station design phase. Oh, oh okay. Um, all right, let me make a note of that. I guess I don't have the, the design inputs. Okay, sim station. What else we have here? Can you please tell us how to set up the finals. You know, it's going to be tough to do that uh, because um, I mean, part of it would be easy. For example, uh, um, for example, the somebody asked, you know, how to set up the for the final. Um, let's go back to this, I guess. Right, so one thing that you could do here is um, is here I have my MVC apps, right? And so I could create in here a new project called Final, but um, yeah, I guess you could create like a new project in here called Final, 
And then that final could reach Smartbox, it could reach SimStation, and it can reach MVC. So it could do, you know, all of those things. But I, I, there wouldn't be much that you could put in that because, uh, because you know, uh, customizing Smartbox and SimStation and MVC are all kind of different from each other. And also then Echo, I didn't make, I, you know, I could have made Echo a customization of SimStation, but it wasn't where it's, you know, it got too confusing. So, you know, here, you know, I mean, again, there's not too much, uh, you know, you create like a final project in here um, in case I ask you something about Echo, but um, it'd be hard to guess what you would need. I do like the fact that, like in Casino, you do have, um, where is that? Actually, let's see, Echo. Oh, this is Echo. Now I'm getting confused with something else. But uh, yeah, there isn't too much that you can do ahead of time uh, for those different customizations. Um, And then let's see, um, we don't have bin. Yeah, let's see, and, and IntelliJ, it's going to um, be, it doesn't have a bin directory. Um, just think for a second, what is it in Unix? Um, not bin, but I think it's, is it out maybe? Yeah, so there's an out and a source. So the source has all the Java files. Right. And the mm -hmm. out, it it breaks it down and puts an out and then production. And then inside production, it has the folders. And then it goes echo. And then it goes the mm -hmm. dot class files. Yeah, well, you know, one one thing that makes things very easy, I think. And uh, I, I, so I never did figure out how to export code with IntelliJ. And so uh, a lot of people have IntelliJ just open up windows to, you know, that directory that you just mentioned. And, uh, you know, so then they don't have to export. They can just test it right there. Uh, but you can, you know, from that directory, if you open a window on that directory, not a command window, but a, brow a, a browser window, you know, then it's easy to just zip all of that together. Right, yeah, I mean, I had to do a little bit of, I had to change one of the settings. I don't quite remember what it was, but I had to change it so where if I build solution uh, for the first time, then it would create the out folder, which yeah. then has a dot class. And then do if I do any type of like customization or any changes, I just have to rebuild it and then it would change itself. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, this is like for testing purposes, right? Because I'm not asking you for any binaries. Oh, okay. So it's just the dot Java files. Yeah. You're just going to have to zip up the dot Java files and your dot, okay. your, your program should not depend on other customizations. Like, you know, I don't want you to import stuff from turtle graphics into whatever your customization is. They can, they only depend on the frameworks they're built on. Okay, well, as our last class, uh, it's been, um, I think, the most interesting semester uh, that I've ever had. Probably you too, and probably by interesting, you can probably think of better words than interesting, but uh, really been impressed with how, you know, how you guys have, uh, have dealt with uh, this in my whole life, and I've never really dealt with uh, anything like what you've had to deal with. So uh, anyway, I'll have an office hour Friday. Uh, I'll have an office hour Monday. Uh, maybe I'll try to schedule one more office hour before your final exam. And uh, so I'll see you in one of those office hours um, or otherwise final exam. Thanks, everybody.